on your computers. Okay. Can I welcome you all to the development control meeting this morning? Uh, as you know, I, I'll start by uh, the opening statement from myself, and then we'll go into the uh, agenda items. Can I welcome all members and officers to this meeting of the Vulnerable Control Committee, which will be held as a hybrid meeting. The meeting will be recorded and will be available via the Council's website to be viewed as soon as practical following this meeting. Everyone participating in this meeting will have access to this meeting either from the Council Chamber or remote locations. Please could everybody ensure that their mobile phones are switched off or on silent mode, please. That includes people at the top as well, please. <clears throat> Members will re receive an electronic copy of the agenda. I will ask officers to present a summary of the key points for the record. The agenda can be viewed on the Council's website. If attending the meeting remotely, mem members are required to keep their cameras on at all times. Whether in the chamber or remote, if any members or officers wish to raise a point or question, they should press the hands up icon on the screen at the top right hand side of the Microsoft team window and I will come to you in the order I receive the request. Please lower your hand once you've finished speaking. The chat button will be disabled for this meeting. Please do not use your microphones until I invite you to do so. Officers from Democratic Services will be supporting this meeting and will be monitoring the use of the microphones throughout the meeting and when necessary will mute those not being used. I would also ask officers to introduce themselves as and when I ask them to speak during the course of the meeting. They should ensure microphones and cameras are switched off only when not in use, please. Today's business could require votes of members. These will be conducted in the normal way. I will now proceed to the agenda business. Okay. Councillor Richard Williams. Councillor Williams? You got your hand up? Can everybody hear me? I can hear yes, I can. Can't hear anything. Oh. Well, can you hear me? Yes, I can now. Yes. I can get nothing from the chamber. Well, huh. Rich, if we take your F1 off, if you're not in the chamber, you should be able to hear because it happened to me as well. Go on, Rich. Ask, ask a question. No, I can't. There's something wrong with this computer then. You're coming through clear to me, Chair. Thank, thank you, Councillor John. Can everybody else hear me out there? Councillor Keane, can you hear me OK? Yeah, I can hear you clearly, Chair. Thank you. So it's Councillor Williams' computer, it is. Can somebody from back office sort that out for him, please? <clears throat> I can't speak to him, can I? Can somebody send him a quick message? <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you, Chair. If there's somebody from Cabinet Committee Services, are they able to message Councillor Richard Williams and, and ask him to reboot his machine, please? I don't think we can. I think the chat's been disabled, isn't it? I'm very trying to get in contact with the council. Thank you. Well, we'll have to wait because you can't start a meeting without him uh, hearing what's going on. Oh, yeah, I did a mine. You could do it manually. I could do mine manually from the very beginning. Yeah.
Hi. We can hear him, but he can't hear us. There we are, Richard. I've just told him to take his F1 off if he's at home. He should be able to hear you then. OK, all, all going. Can you um, hear us now, Richard? I can. Thank you, Chair. Now, have, have you dealt with item two, uh, uh, declarations? No, I was just on apologies first, and then I was going to come to number two. OK, then. I'll be get glad, uh, declaring an interest, that's all. Thank okay, you. that's fine. Any no, right? Let's go to the agenda again, then, please. Uh, any apologies for absence? Councillor Easterbrook. I've I've had I've had um, Richard Collins is is not here, but Councillor Pratt is here, and David Harrington is here as well. So only Councillor Richard Collins uh, has given his apologies. Councillor Tim Wood. Councillor Tim Wood. And Councillor Easterbrook. And Councillor Easterbrook. Yeah. Okay. Nobody else? Oh, Councillor Waltham? Sorry. Oh, not more technical problems. Mike? Yeah, thank you, Chair. I'm going to have to leave about 10, 1 o'clock in case we're dragging on, OK? Yeah, that's fine. Another appointment. Yeah, well, we, we won't be at one, Mike, I hope. <laughs> well, you never know. <laughs> no, no, no. OK, that's apologies for absence done. Then number two, Richard, declarations of interest. Yes, thank you, Chair. It's uh, item nine, the prejudicial. Um, the One of the objectors is known to me. Thank you. OK, thank you for that. Councillor John. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, planning applications for high bond and the P23412 P out because I'm the local member. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you for that. Count yeah. Oh, Council Council Waltham. Yeah, personal interest agenda item nine. A member of the Gen Town Council. I don't take part in planning. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Hughes. A prejudicial interest in P two four three two F U L, um, and I'll be speaking on behalf of residents. Um, yeah, that's John Street Dogmobile. Yeah, okay, thank you for that. OK, site visits to confirm that Monday 29th and Monday the 15th proposed site inspections arising from... Can somebody formally move that, please? Move. Seconded. Thank you. Can somebody formally move the minutes of the 22nd, please? Move. Thank you. Public speakers, we've got quite a few today, so we're going to we'll come back to that in a second. So we'll just say there is public speakers. There's no amendment sheet today. OK, so if we go to number seven, can somebody just note the development control guidelines, please? Thank you. Right, number eight, P2432 full, John Street, Ogmore Vale. Councillor Hughes. Five minutes. OK. And the clock will start when you, when you start speaking. Thank you, Della. Thank you. Um, the residents have raised a number of material planning concerns, um, one being neighbour amenity and um, specifically noise. Whilst the report states the noise level should be broadly in line with that of a residential property, this was not the case when the care home was situated in Walters Road and there were often more staff at the property than stated in the application and noise in particular loud noise at night was an issue. They've also raised the issue of on-street parking St John Street, as many Valley Streets already, have issues with on-street parking and the report states there would be a requirement for three spaces. Residents are concerned that there will be more vehicles in this part of the property when you include staff and other professionals who may need to visit any young persons at the property. Um, they are concerned uh, of perceived antisocial behaviour and there have been several visits to the property by the police, including one at 3am earlier this week. It is accepted that the police could attend any property at any time, but residents are concerned as this has never been the normal in the street, and they just are a little worried. <clears throat> in the meeting of the 30th of November, where planning permission was granted for the Walters Road property, um, Alex Fitzpatrick from Social Service, Services 
stated that this was an exceptional circumstance and it is not a commonplace activity. She was also confident with the level of expertise of the provider. So given this experience, I was shocked when they were unable to complete the works required to register the Walters Road property with the care inspector, hence the move to St John Street. Although I understand that it is not a legal requirement to apply for planning permission, residents are upset that the care home was up and running before they were consulted. And this is now the second time this has happened in quite a short space of time. They feel BCBC are not following their own advice with regards to planning permission and that it is bound to be granted as social services have already placed children at the property. This perception is understandable given that the public are not experts in planning matters. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, that they're not experts um, in, in planning matters, and I feel it isn't a good look for the authority when they are seemingly placing children without the permission. I do understand, though, that it is not a land planning concern, and these have been raised separately with social services. Thank you. Thank you, Della. Right, the next speaker then, we'll go on to number nine, um, P2373. No, no, oh, sorry, yeah. sorry, yes, yes. yes sir. No, 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 no. You won. You can you give the officers perspective now, please? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, for the purpose of the recording, my name is Ewan Sexton, uh, Principal Planning Officer. Um, so this application relates to the change of use of 67 St John Street in Ogmore Vale from a residential dwelling to a care home for children which falls within the use class C2. Uh, as Councillor Hughes just touched on then, to provide a little bit of context, you'll remember that um, this committee resolved to approve an application for a similar application at 57 Walters Road, which is one street over from St John Street. Um, and because the care provider wasn't able to convert the house in line with the requirements of the care inspector for Wales, they haven't moved properties. Um, this property is already um, to the standards required. Um, so the care home be used to house up to two children with standing st standard staffing levels of one to one expected at the property. There will be a maximum of three members of staff on site at any time, which will be on the occasions that a manager is also present. As you're likely aware, the application has been submitted that retrospectively, and this was done ahead of the plan application being submitted because of the immediate need to provide housing for the child. The application has been brought to committee today due to the number of objections received from local residents. I'd suggest that the main issues for members to consider relate to the highways impact of development, as well as the perception that the development will result in an increase in antisocial behaviour in the area. These are the two most common material planning concerns that are raised by neighbouring residents. The property doesn't benefit from any designated car parking spaces, with the majority of the parking on St John Street taking place on streets. The parking requirement for the care home is not dissimilar from that of the existing dwelling, which would require three car parking spaces. Is a public car park situated to the north of the site, which staff or visitors could use in combination with on-street parking. The highways officers requested that there's cycle parking provision made at the site, and subject to this, the proposal is considered to be acceptable in terms of its highways impact. Um, as Councillor Hughes touched on, applications of this nature often create concerns of an increase in antisocial behaviour in the local area. There will be care workers on site 24-7, and they will be specifically trained to look after the children who are housed here. As we discussed previously, for applications of this nature, um, there are other bodies who are able to control these potential issues, including Environmental Health, South Wales Police and the Care Inspectorate for Wales. It's important to remember that the people living in the property are not offenders. They're simply vulnerable children who have come from a difficult background. This application seeks to provide them with safe housing in the residential environment. So having considered the proposals, we found the application to be acceptable in all respects and as such is recommended for approval. Thank you. Can you see any officer's recommendation? Can somebody formally move and second, please? Thank you. Right, anybody going to... Oh, Council... Council Hughes has left a uh, hand up. Okay, can, no, Council Clark. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think I... Um, go along with the concerns of the, the local residents and um, the speaker. Um, to have placed a child in that, I'll call it a home, to have placed the child already from this authority without uh, 
either planning permission or the or care inspectorate. Um, I, I just can't go along with that. I feel that uh, members of the public will think that this application is predetermined. And um, as I say, I just can't go along with that. Um, and I just w wish to state that I will not be taking part in, uh, I want it noted that I will not be uh, voting or um, approving this application. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Do you want to answer that question, anyone? Oh, All right, thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah, th th thank you, Councillor. Um, let's get my camera on. For the purposes of the recording, my name is Roger Davis, Development and Billing Control Manager. Um, yes, the same same scenario happened with um, the previous site in Motters Road, and uh, for the avoidance of doubt, um, there's not going to be two of the same facilities in a short distance. Uh, that other um, property is now apparently been uh, occupied as a family dwelling, and uh, planning application will be required to convert that back to a dwelling now. But that's looks like to be the um, the intention. In this instance, uh, as, you, as we, we've talked about um, several times before, retrospective applications are, are an issue, but there's nothing that we can do as a local planning authority to stop people from applying retrospectively, unfortunately, unless the Welsh Government or, or the legislation has changed, there's nothing we can do about that. Um, the occupation Higher. The child in, in question, obviously, once the K inspector for Wales deemed the previous property to be unsuitable, obviously the child would have been um, homeless then without without another property to move into and um, to avoid that happening. Uh, they moved in in advance of obtaining planning permission. Um, but as we did in November, uh, if we approve this in, in planning terms, then the care inspectorate can issue the license for the premises to be run as a care home, and then they can take it from there. But um, but as I said, we, we can't unfortunately refuse retrospective applications on the basis that they have been applied for retrospectively. And they, to be fair, I think in this instance, it is obviously a case of needs must in this instance, uh, as it was with the, with the previous application. So, um, it's just unfortunate that that's the way it has happened. Uh, we do have uh, Alex Fitzpatrick on the call. If uh, if Alex, if you want to uh, mention anything else on top of what I've just said, are you with us, Alex? I am, yes, thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Alex Fitzpatrick. I'm the Group Manager for Placement and Provider Services here in Bridge End. Uh, just for the sake of absolute clarity, this is not a case where this is a, a separate incident. I stand by what I said when I came to the committee before, that these circumstances are indeed a rarity. This is an ongoing situation that has occurred because the adaptations couldn't be made in the original home. And as uh, Rodri has highlighted, the alternative for this young person would be to not have a placement. We are working um, incredibly hard as a service to try and work with our local providers to develop what we need for our young children here in Bridgend to enable them to remain in their local communities when they've already experienced the trauma of becoming care experienced. And what we are faced with in situations where we have the national crisis in terms of placement availability for children is often difficult choices where we're looking at what the best available option is for our children rather than you know being able to cherry pick from a range of options and the members here will be cited on other reports that have come before you in terms of outlining all the efforts that we are making to address our sufficiency issue in terms of this particular case we have an experienced provider who we are still confident with. The matters that led to the change of residence are practical matters that related to their ability to register with Care Inspectorate Wales. And we have been assured by the provider that those issues are not here in this current property. Thank you for that comment. Councillor Hopkins, please. 
Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I've got a few concerns about this application, to be honest. Um, number one, um, the parking is going to be a nightmare. Um, three cars outside that property at any one time. The, you know, everybody, as everybody knows, residential parking is a nightmare anyway. And the fact that it's been stated that if there is any antisocial behaviour, there's other authorities that can get involved, such as the police. That doesn't really instill me with a lot of confidence, to be honest. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor John, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I suppose I, it's one question, but in, in a couple of parts, if you like. So if you'll indulge me in just asking the one question. Um, are there, were, were there any complaints made to SRS while the care home was at Walters Road? And also, why are the police advised on the operation of the home? Have issues been raised with the police? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Well, I've just been told, Councillor John, we don't have that information, and I do apologise. It's, it's not in our remit, apparently. So, uh, uh, Ewan, do you want to just quickly? Yeah, so obviously SRS are a separate body from ourselves, so we... We don't know whether SRS have been contacted on the Walters Road property or, or on this one. Um, in, in terms of the police, the police have been consulted. They provided comments um, and they requested that the care provider set up a management plan um, in consultation with the police. The care provider has provided some additional information um, and has said that they, they are in contact with the police. So um, on that basis, we're um, you know we're happy with that. Okay, let, let, let's go on a different channel here, Councillor John. I'll just bear with me a second. Alex, was SRS called to that site or not? At the previous site, I take it you called Councillor John here. Yes, the Walters Road site. And no, the question was. If any complaints were made to SRS, thank you, Chair. Right. Alex, oh. do you know of any? Apologies, what is SRS? So, Chair, regularly Excuse me, sorry. Shared regulatory services? Yeah. Nothing has been brought to my attention. OK, thank you for that. OK, Councillor Hughes, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I note that the uh, property has got a rear lane. Um, it's the same question I asked back, to, back in November with the other properties where is there an opportunity for parking at the rear of the property, uh, possibly with the conversion into the garden, which would hopefully alleviate some of the uh, on-street parking issues. Thanks. I wish I'll answer that question for you. Councillor Hughes. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Um, the same answer as, as I re recall giving it that the last site was that that rear lane is not maintainable. It's actually a public right of way. So there are an, an, a small number of residential properties which we understand have a legal right of access over it, but we're not satisfied that this property would. OK, thank you, Councillor Hughes. Councillor Griffiths, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just wonder whether the officers could clarify for me that there's obviously a change of use here from an old use to a new use. What's, what's the impact on the on the parking requirement for the previous use compared to the new proposed use? Is there actually a change or, or is the overall parking requirement roughly the same? Thank you for that, Councillor Griffiths. Rob? Thank you again, and, and apologies for the benefit of the recording. I'm Rob Morgan, the Principal Officer, Highways Development Control. Um, with the matter of parking, the existing property as a three-bedroom property would generate three off-street parking spaces. Um, as a care home, as a children's care home, with the number of staff that's been suggested, the requirement is just under three spaces. So, if, from our perspective, it's a nil detriment situation. Happy with that, Simon? Yes, thanks very much. It was very clear. Thank you. Well, I can't see any other body wanting uh, questions. So it's for the officer's recommendation or against the officer's recommendation. Is there any, let's make it easy then. Is there anybody against the officer's recommendation? 
Yes, I am, Chair. Can we have a right. recorded vote, please? Sorry. I just like it noted that uh, I'm not taking part in in uh, the decision. Abstain. You're abstaining then? No, I'm not. I'm not taking part. Right. Okay. Who, who else spoke then? Councillor Williams, is that you? John, oh, Councillor yeah, John, was it? Oh, you, who, what, somebody wanted a recorded vote, did they? Yeah, sorry, Chair, I should have put my hand up. Yes, Councillor John, thanks, Chair. Okay, is that seconded? Okay, Councillor Waffham has seconded. Okay, so we'll have a recorded vote. Yeah, one of the guys at the back. Can Mike? Who's in then? Take a note of these. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Can I? Okay. This is a recorded vote, obviously, and our solicitor will have to take it because I don't think there's anybody here, but the, uh, from the backroom staff that can do it. So. Yeah. I, I am going to list either. Um, oh, there'll be a list on the second page when they're yeah. off in attendance. There yeah. they are. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, if you put your mic on and just call them one at a time for or against. Okay. Right. Councillor Barrow, for or against, please. For. Oh. Councillor N. Clark, for or against, please. She's not voting. Uh, against. Uh, or against, okay. Okay. Councillor R. J. Collins, for or against? He's absent. He's, he's given us apologies. Right. Councillor C. D C. L. C. Davis, Davies, for or against, please? Right. Councillor Easterbrooks, absent. Uh, Councillor Granville? For. Councillor H. Griffiths? For. Councillor S. J. Griffiths? For. Councillor D. T. Harrison? For. Councillor M. L. Hughes? For. Councillor Delahue? She can't vote. She's she, a speaker. She's speaker. She's left the meeting, yeah. Le left. Councillor M. R. John? Against. Councillor M. J. Cairn. For. Councillor W. J. Kendall. For. Councillor Llewellyn Hopkins. Against. Councillor J. E. Pratt. For. Councillor A. Waffen. Yeah, for. And lastly, Councillor R. Williams. Four. Four. We have one, two, three abstentions. Uh, Councillor Clark, you were uh, against. We have, sorry, yeah, we have three against. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten in favour. So that's passed then. Thank you all. Right. Oh yeah, we'll just get Council Hughes back in. Steve, you'll be up next. Uh, Chair, with your description, could the member of the public go first? Yes, that's is fine. That Helen Walker, is it? Is Jamie, is Jamie? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Oh, you're online, are you? Yes. Okay, thank you. You'll have five minutes, this is Walker, when it's, when you start to speak. Okay. Yet again, it was with great concern and consternation that the residents of Kydray Street received notification of a planning application that will have a significant adverse effect on everyone living and working in the street should it go ahead. 
we do not consider that the proposed change of use is suitable for this residential conservation area on the grounds of over intensification. We know that houses are needed to help with the homeless, but to place this HMO next to the two Wallach pro properties, one an HMO and the complex needs that they deal with there, means that this is not the place for yet another HMO to be. There is another HMO in very close proximity in Park Street, and we have just learned that the Council have received application for another HMO at number 11 Park Street, making a total of four in a very close proximity to this residential street. In 2016, the Council agreed to allow a change of use at 12 Park Street for the Wallach to provide accommodation for people with specific issues, substance misuse, mental health problems, youth and families. Every concern that we had expressed for that application has gone on to be proved true. Kaidre Street is a residential area. We now have a number of young families living here, and at present we have to experience drug, drug addicts coming to the lane at the back of numbers 10 to 14 Park Street to buy their drugs and inject, leaving needles behind. Sometimes there are groups of 12 at a time, which is very frightening. One of the conditions for agreeing the planning of number 12 was that there should be no access to the back lane. This has not been enforced. Police have been called on a number of occasions and an ambulance when someone overdosed and was lying face down in the street. My partner and a neighbor's children have been threatened with physical violence by youths when going down the road. For a limited period, the police carried out regular surveillance. The staff at James Vines Dentist, number 16 Park Street, next door to the proposed HMO, have already received verbal and sexual harassment. There has also been verbal abuse to his patients. He is also obviously concerned about the security of the practice as it is a site with controlled drugs. The proposal includes a rear extension and access for builders, deliveries and actual work being carried out from the lane will be a complete nightmare for his staff and residents alike in a street who use it constantly. Finan's practice has been in situ since 1969, 55 years. It is one of the last NHS practices in the area, and he does not know if they can carry on with the potential disruption and aggravation from next door if the application is agreed. An area at the back of number 14 is marked as yard. Would this mean that people would meet there amongst the cars, creating even more noise than we already have to put up with? Residents regularly contact Wallach between 11.30 and 3 a.m. about music blaring forth from the open skylight. Occupants have climbed onto the roof from the skylight, shouting and playing loud music. There is no CCTV that covers the whole back area of these properties, so many spots for illegal activity to take place. Residents are frightened to let their children walk down the street alone because of these youths. We are concerned that the occupant occupants at the Wallach could have a detrimental influence on vulnerable people entering an HMO at number 14, and we could see an increase in the drug uptake. The plans do not appear to show that this HMO would have a warden. This is of considerable concern to us all, as there is a high probability that the occupants are likely to have challenging needs. Would police be our only point of contact? There is a potential loss of privacy to the back gardens of numbers 2 to 8 Kaidre Street, from what would looks like a three-storey proposed rear extension and conversion in the loft. The parking situation in Kaidre Street is already appalling because of being so close to town and the access only not being enforced. Policy PLA 11 parking standards states all development will be required to provide appropriate levels of parking. At present, there is space for two cars to be parked behind number 14, but with the rear extension, this could be eliminated. Point 32 site visit, no has been ticked, but the site can be seen from the public road and footpath. I have lived in this property for over 40 years. There has always been a very close community here in Kaidre Street, but this proposal is making us all very anxious. The present situation is unacceptable, but this will certainly be made worse should the pro proposal go ahead. Again, we understand there is a need for accommodation of this type in Bridgend, but it should not all end up in the same area. One Thank second to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Steve.
Say them again, five minutes when you speak. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Committee. Um, I'm here this morning speaking on behalf of myself and Councillor Tim Wood, uh, who are local members for Bridgend Central. Uh, we obviously can't speak on behalf of Councillor Easterbrook, who is a member of your committee. Uh, but we are here to support and represent the residents of Kydre Street and Park Street who contacted us with their concerns, many of which you've already heard detailed very clearly by Helen Walker. We are concerned. We're, we're concerned for a number of reasons. We're concerned because it always seems to be myself and Councillor Wood that are making representations to your committee over HMOs. And the reason for that being is we seem to be getting so many of them in a very small area. Uh, uh, Mrs Walker makes reference to another planning application that's coming forward, which you can't take into consideration now, <clears throat> but a property just down the road has also got a HMO <clears throat> application in, and that will be considered in due course. However, Park Street is changing, and it's not changing in a way that the residents who currently live there are comfortable with. You've already had detailed the first-hand experience that residents are living it with, and whilst ever they are police matters, they are matters that need to be considered. It states here, and it has already been confirmed, this is for number 14. Number 12 is already a HMO. Number 10 is also a property that used to be residential as used by the Wallage for very complex people. You've heard firsthand, and as local members, we get reported very regularly. We've been working with Safer Bridgend on the number of incidents that are happening around this area. This is a conservation area. It is a residential area but it's becoming a HMO area. And I do note in the report, it states about 10% of properties within a 50 mile radius. I, I would ask, um, it, does, it would not lead to more than 10% of all residential properties within a 50 mile radius of the proposals being a HMO. I don't know the actual figures, but I would like confirmation on how many there are, because there is a perception amongst local residents and local members that there are a lot of HMOs at the bottom end of Park Street uh, you recently approved one a little bit further up past Park Street with this applicant. And I want to be very, very clear on this, that neither myself or Councillor Wood are in any way critical of the applicant or anything else. Uh, we've, we've had the, the, the honour, the privilege of being invited in to see what they do there. This isn't about against the applicant. This is against this specific application being so close to other HMOs and changing the area of Park Street. Um, I don't really need to take up the full five minutes. That's kind of where we are. Um, but both Councillor Wood and myself fully support the concerns of the residents. We see it firsthand. We have a WhatsApp chat available with them, um, and they're, they're contacting us very regularly to detail the antisocial behaviour so we can confirm it happens. It has been reported to Safer Bridgend. There have been police operations there. This isn't what could happen if this is on top of what's already happening there. Um, the only other thing I would like to mention is that we know, that, and it was made reference by Mrs. Walker, we know there is a need for this kind of house. But this proposal doesn't take people off the housing register. It keeps them on the housing register. This is temporary accommodation. This is not people moving into properties. This is people staying on the housing register, just not in hotels. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Committee. Thank you, Councillor Vetso, for that. Right. Jamie Cox. Are you there, Jamie? I'm here. Okay, you have you we put a five minute clock up now and when you start speaking, the clock will start. Down to you. Thank you, councillors. This property has been identified to use as temporary accommodation for adults within the Bridge End Borough. D2 already operates in ten councils across the South Wales area, looking after over three hundred people in seventy-two temporary accommodation units. These range from small two-bed terraced houses to a 10-bed HMO. D2 already successfully operates three temporary accommodation units in the Bridge End Borough. D2 manage all of our properties very diligently. Properties and tenants are visited daily, Monday to Friday, by the dedicated house manager to check on their welfare and the condition of the property. Any issues are reported to the housing team and any maintenance issues are reported to our dedicated maintenance team for action. There will be CCTV cameras covering all communal parts of the property. Each morning these cameras are checked and a full report is sent to the housing team. We work very closely with the council and report back the activities of tenants to the council. 
We have fully trained house managers who keep in contact with tenants, even if they are not seen on the house visit. D2 keeps the houses to a high standard with a full time maintenance manager and regular collections of any excess rubbish. We also employ cleaning contractors to visit on a regular basis to assist tenants in keeping the property clean. D2 operates a strict house rule structure, which is explained to each tenant on moving in, and they are required to sign a copy of these rules. If occupants do not adhere to the house rules, the information is reported back to the council to act on. We have a very good working relationship with the team in Bridgend and are in daily contact about all houses and tenants. The Bridgend housing team decides who is placed following discussion on client profile. Tenants that are placed are not on occupation contracts, but licenses. And therefore, if breaches of rules occur, then these issues are dealt with and placements can be ended and the tenants can be moved on. If issues or antisocial behaviour occurs, then these will be addressed directly by both the house manager and the housing team immediately. D2 operates a 24-7 on-call system for both tenants and neighbours, and this number will, made will be made available. The house manager will also introduce themselves to neighbours to promote an open and approachable relationship. The level of accommodation that D2 provides for temporary accommodation is turned to a very high standard with the ethos of giving people good accommodation to live in and they will treat it well. D2 are committed to providing temporary accommodation housing solutions to vulnerable people and we pride ourselves on providing accommodation to those without a safe place to stay. This type of accommodation is far more appropriate than bed and breakfast or hotels and gives the tenant a better chance of maintaining their placement in the property and a greater chance of successful move on to their own accommodation. We also believe this type of accommodation is a significant cost saving for the local authority compared to alternatives. D2 want to ensure bridge end homeless adults are looked after in their community in a bridge end home. I hope this gives a brief understanding of our service and what type of company we are. Thank you for that, Jamie. OK, if we can now go on to the officer's uh, brief. Dion, please. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> uh, for the purposes of this recording, my name is Dion Douglas. I'm a senior planner here at uh, Bridge End Council. Um, I think you've been given a, a pretty good overview of the, the proposal, but uh, just to reiterate, we're looking at 14 Park Street, which is just across the way. It's a three-storey mid-terrace house at the bottom of Newcastle Hill. Uh, formerly it was used as offices, currently it's vacant. So we have the applicant uh, seeking a change of use from offices to HMO for a maximum of six persons. Um, the proposal would involve internal alterations to the building only. There'd be no external changes. Uh, no additions at the back and no, no changes to the roof. Um, parking for two vehicles would be retained at the rear of the property and they're accessed off the rear lane and a private courtyard would be provided for residents at the rear of the property as well. Um, we received uh, representations from the two councillors, uh, one who you've heard from already. Uh, we received one uh, submission and support of the application and six objections and opposition, um, most from residents of Kaidre, but also the adjoining dentist. Uh, the relevant um, planning concerns that were raised were antisocial behaviour and noise, um, an over-intensification of HMOs in this part of the borough, and uh, car parking and traffic issues, highways issues. So um, in examining the proposal against the uh, local development plan, and it of course is the, uh, the new local development plan, not the old one, uh, there are some more policies, different policies to consider. Um, obviously the principle of residential accommodation is recognised in the main set settlement of Bridge End, and obviously this application, this proposal goes some way to meeting that residential accommodation need. Um, of course, it's the conversion of an office to HMO, but you've got to appreciate that the building was originally built as a residential property, so it's really returning to its roots. Um, there's a policy of the LDP that seeks a development of new housing, including the reuse of vacant properties. Obviously, this application is going some way to meeting that need. 
A new policy in the LDP is COM7, which is houses in multiple occupation, um, and that quite specifically deals with this proposal, and um, obviously it, uh, it's, it's very important looking ahead at future um, HMO applications. Um, the policy establishes a number of criteria against um, which every application is deemed to be considered. Um, one of the key uh, criteria uh, which Councillor Bletslow referred to was the 10% of residential properties within a 50 metre radius of the proposal being HMOs. So if you put a, a 50 metre circle around the property, there should be no more than 10% of HMOs in that area. Um, I've, I've done the research, I've done the calculations, I've done a bit of door knocking or walking the streets at least anyway. Um, I've relied on information that has been provided from shared regulatory services about licensed HMOs and uh, I've uh, identified that there are 29 properties within 50 metres of this application site. Um, there are currently two existing HMOs, one being the immediately joining property and the other one being Taffy's Tavern, which is just across the way. Um, this particular application would be number three within that 50 metre radius. So that would mean that, uh, being number three, that it would meet the 10% criteria. So in terms of this new council policy, the HMO is deemed to be acceptable in that location because it's not leading to an over-intensification of HMOs. Um, the other relevant um, planning concerns raised were about car parking. Obviously, it's a, it's a part of the borough that's uh, intensively used for on-street parking, mainly because it's proximity to the, to the town centre, but also obviously used by um, people visiting the dentist and other businesses in the area. Um, the highway's um, input and advice that I've had is that the two, retention of the two car parking spaces should be adequate for the six-person HMO, um, but we're also recommending a condition that um, cycle parking be provided at the rear of the property as well. Um, so in a nutshell, uh, on balance, um, I'm, I've, we're finding the uh, application and the change of use acceptable to this property and this location and recommending approval subject to conditions. Thank you. Thank you for that, Dion. You can see the recommendation on page 39, officers, uh, granted it. Can somebody formally move and second, please? Thank you. All right. Councillor Hughes, you're first, please. Yeah, um, thank you, Chair. Uh, my question is, this about the 50-metre um, rule, uh, the num number of properties, but um, we've uh, had it reported that there are two other HMOs in that uh, vicinity. Um, but I think what's probably more um, relevant is how many units that are within each of these HMOs, uh, because HMOs, you know, do vary obviously in, in size. So I think in order to give a bit more colour and description to what we've uh, been presented today, if we have an indication of the total number of units within those two HMS, HMOs, if that information is available to us. I will ask the officer. I'm sure Dion has got that information. Yes, certainly. I was probably anticipating that. The uh, the adjoining HMO is six bedroom, so exactly the same as the current application. And the former Taffy's Tavern, uh, that's got 11 bedrooms, so that's a bit larger. Did that answer your question? OK, thank you for that. Councillor John, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, listen to what Dion said. Um, simple maths would tell me that it's over 10%. It's 10.34%. So therefore, it's over 10% of the the HMOs in within 50 metres. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I'm sure Dion will come back to that question. Um, thank you, Councillor. According to my calculations, there were 29 properties within the 50 metre radius. Um, I've calculated that there are currently two HMOs. This one's number three. 
So if we're looking at 10% of 29, that's 2.9, and I'm rounding up the 2.9 to 3. Thank you for that. Are you happy with that, Councillor John? No, sorry, Chair. I don't know where he gets his numbers from. 3 out of 29 is over 10%. Well, the, the, you, you, uh, Rod, do you want to come in? Yes, it's uh, it, it is it is a mathematical um, equation. What we've worked out is is twenty nine units. Um, Ten percent of that is two point nine units. So if you round that up, that's the three units. So if we get any more applications in this area within this fifty meter radius. Uh, Obviously, we can't have 0.1 of a unit coming. So it's it's a case of rounding that up to three units would be acceptable. If it was 2.4, if it was 24 properties and it was 10%, that would be 2.4. We'd probably round that down to two units. But with 2.9, you round that up naturally to the three units because you can't have a, a partition of a property. So this makes it three units within that 50 meter radius. And this is basically compliant with our new policy in, in the uh, replacement local development plan, which you approved uh, a few weeks back. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Roddy, for that explanation. Councillor Pratt, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, just to go back to that, and I understand that limits have to be made, and you, you, you know, and and sometimes calculations don't always work out for people, and 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 it sounds fine on paper, but the reality is what happens on the street, pardon the pun. Um, you know, I, I'm just concerned that whether the calculation is under 10% or not, that Park Street is becoming an area for HMOs, you know, and it, it's, I, and, you know, it's just, it seems to be becoming that way. And they are within relatively close locations be it whether they're inside or outside of a 50 meter radius I, I know we have to have a limit somewhere so i'm not going to argue that but it's just the the um so, so there's the quantitative the qualitative side of it is is this an over intensification i think that's the argument that needs to be you know do, do residents in park street want hmos to the extent that they're they're, they're having does this authority want HMOs to the extent that they seem to be appearing in one area of Bridgen Town Centre rather than spreading them around. So it's um, it's a difficult one. I just, you know, we, we, we've had a quantitative argument here on whether it's under 10% or not. I'm not going to argue it, but what is the qualitative argument over how people who are happy to live in Park Street are now being inundated, as it appears to be, by HMOs? Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that, Jonathan. Thank you, Chair, for the purpose of recording. My name is Jonathan Parsons, the Group Manager for Planning and Development Services. Um, I, I take the points that have been raised by, by the members that have uh, spoken um, on, on the technical mathematical grounds and uh, also with uh, Councillor Pratt, who's, who's raised a, quite a valid point on the uh, qualitative impact as well as the quantitative impact. And as members will be aware, and I've, I've Try to stress this as um, as much as possible when we, we are making um, decisions on planning applications. It's it's a, a lot of it is to do with the the balance and, and providing the correct planning balance and weighing up all the evidence, weighing up all the um, um, policies, weighing up all the other concerns and coming to a, a recommendation. And that's what's happened in this case. And the case officer has, has indicated that all, all the matters that have been raised have been taken into account. Um, the issue of the technicality on, on the policy side, um, yeah, that, that's, that's again, it's a valid point. But if you went to an appeal and you had a planning inspector and you had a, a, a maybe a legal officer questioning you on, you know, is, is that enough evidence to refuse this outright? I would say probably not. But when you have to rely on these quantitative aspects, which have um, actually been raised uh, by the residents and, and the local member. And I, I don't think you can underestimate the, the views of, of residents and local members. These, these are the people that are on the ground, as it were. And we fully understand the concerns that have been raised. Um, and 
uh, I, 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 I not, we're not dismissing those in this recommendation, but we have to consider the land use planning um, principles first. That's what the purpose of the planning, um, uh, the, the planning act says, planning policy is, and this purpose of, of the planning authority of which this committee is part. Uh, there are other there are other organisations that control the licensing and control the antisocial behaviour associated with these uses. Uh, and we can't, as, as planners, we, we, we can't um, we can't be policemen, we can't be environmental health officers, we're not a licensing authority. We're just looking at land use planning matters. Uh, and as I said, it's not to say that the other, the, the other issues that have been raised are not valid, they are, but there are other agencies that, that would look at that. In, in this particular case, the, the, the development has been weighed up. Um, the recommendation is for approval, and all these issues have been taken into consideration when we come to that balance. Um, so if another application came in in the same street tomorrow, then we may have to look at that policy a little bit more carefully. Um, and again, we would have to take it all the factors into account, but that policy would weigh against any other future proposals. But in this case, taking all matters into consideration, the recommendation is for approval, and, and that's the recommendation to you as a committee. Um, and I would ask you as members, if you weren't happy with this, would you be would you be comfortable in, in taking this to an appeal situation, and on what evidence would you base that? Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that. Uh, can we go on, uh, Alan? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, I, I certainly uh, totally concur and agree with the comments made by the first two speakers in relation to this matter. It's uh, for me, it's one HMO too many in a small area. Now, 10% in a small area is, is a quite a large figure. And my question would be, how did you arise at arrive at a 10%. Where did that figure come from? What What's it based on? Okay, thank you for that. John, 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 John Jay, will go on to that. Yeah. Oh, okay. John will answer that. Um, I, I, I couldn't go into the detail, details of that at this moment. That's the policy that went forward in the LDP. Nobody raised any questions of that at the time. No. Um, but it, it is based on a, on a formula and it is based on um, uh, experience uh, with, within this area and other areas. I can get that more information on that to you, Councillor, if you wish. I can circulate that afterwards as, as, to, yeah, as, as to how we came to that, that calculation. Um, but the previous LDP had no such uh, limitations in it, uh, and everything was dealt with on its particular merits. Um, but. I'd, so from my knowledge, 10% is, 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 a, is a norm for a, uh, an area such as Bridgend. Okay. Just for me, Chair, I just feel that 10% for a 50-meter area is, is huge, to be honest. Uh, but that's my humble opinion. Yeah, well, what, what, what I can suggest is that members should start reading the new LDP, because there's lots of updates in there, and if you're not briefed on it, you get, you get lost in it otherwise. Okay, Nora? Uh, thank you, Chair. Oh, sorry, sorry, hang a second. Oh. Gian, did you want to come back in? Sorry. My apologies, uh, Councillor Clark. Just just a little word on the 10%. Um, in my previous role, before I came to Bridge End, only at the end of last year, I worked at Cardiff Council. And Cardiff Council, as you can imagine, um, deal with a lot of HMO applications, a lot more than obviously here in Bridge End. Um, there was policy background, but there was also um, an SBG which de de dealt with HMOs. And across Cardiff City, it was a 10% um, over a 50 metre radius. However, in two particular parts of Cardiff, it was increased to 20%. And that was really in areas around the university, plus Neward and um, Cathays. So um, all I can say is that as far as I'm aware, the 10% is probably guided by what, what other councils have done in their districts. Thank you very much. Thank you for that explanation. Councillor Clark, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to um, explore the parking provision. Um, in the previous application, the officer mentioned that the property was a three bedroom property, therefore, it, it had three on street uh, parking uh, allowance. 
Um, so does that apply to this application? Six bedrooms, six on-street parking provisions. Um, and the first speaker, uh, the resident, um, mentioned about um, drug taking, um, you know, parents not wishing their children to walk down the street on their own. So there is a, um, at the moment, there's a perceived uh, fear and safety issue. Um, and put me right if I, you know, if I, if I am not correct, isn't that um, a planning issue? Perceived fear? Thank you. Okay. Rob, do you want to answer that particular question, please? On the, oh, oh, Lee. Thank you, Chair. Uh, for the purposes of recording, my name is Lee Tuck. I'm the uh, Principal Highways uh, Development Control Officer. Uh, thank you, Councillor Clark. Uh, yes, in our parking SPG, which we carry around diligently, um, it's uh, a care home is in there, but a HMO isn't. There isn't a parking standard for HMOs. Um, they are dealt with on an as-case basis, uh, and we have always gone with the thought that if you're in a HMO, you do not own a car, you don't have access to a car, and if you do, you generally get moved on because you don't qualify for that type of uh, accommodation. That's what we've always been told. So the two parking spaces are really for the, the staff and any visitors, um, which isn't uh, you know, uh, unusual for that type of, you know, we've had two to three in, in other locations in Kevin Kruber, places like that. So um, it was considered acceptable and is a betterment on the six offices that were there. And that's how I looked at it. Six offices, all, all with solicitors in, must have generated 10, 15 cars a day. So, um, or had the potential to. So um, this was a, a betterment as I saw it, that there was two spaces uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, issues. Could, could you put that down, please? Thank you. Right, sorry. No problem. Thanks. Um, so yes, that's how we that's how we determined it. But uh, obviously, going forward, we will be looking at HMO parking in more detail. Okay. Does that answer your question, Councillor Clark? Okay. Uh, next. Sorry, Chair. If I could come back to the uh, perception of yes. fear and safety. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. Jonathan's will answer that for you. Thank you, Chair. You're quite correct, um, Councillor Clark. Um, it can be in some circumstances. It can be a material planning consideration. But there's everything, it's what weight you attach to that and what the evidence is. But you're quite correct, it can be in some cases. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, Councillor Kern, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Well, the question I was going to ask has been asked by most of my uh, colleagues, and it's actually been answered by Jonathan. But I would like to say that I still think it's it does seem a lot of uh, HMOs in one particular street, even though it's well within the uh, planning regulations and the, the distance and it's within the 10% and all that. It does seem to me that there it does seem to be a lot of HMOs in uh, Park Street and uh, it doesn't quite sit right with me. I wouldn't want to, well, it just doesn't sit right with me. It seems a lot of HMOs, even though it's well within the guidance, in one area. That's basically all I got to say in it at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Councillor Hopkins, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to ask. So the HMO is in Park Street. Are they? Is Park Street being chosen largely due to the size of the houses there, please? Hmm? Uh, possibly. Rod, will answer yeah. that now. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, that that could be the case, um, but. In this instance, as in the other HMO in the street, and the <laughs> conversion of uh, the former uh, Taffy's Bar, which hasn't been approved yet, um, they are small HMOs, so between three and six unrelated individuals sharing facilities. <laughs> so they're not, so that is a use class C4. Once you go up to seven, eight, nine, more inhabitants, then that is basically in a use class of its own, sui generis. So it's they looked at uh, in a slightly different way. So, but in the, this instance and the one next to it, they're small HMOs up to a maximum of six <laughs> individuals. So perhaps you're right, they, the, the properties are across three floors most of the time, so they do give more scope for more accommodation. 
But as I said, the, the two applications, well, the, the existing HMO and this application is for small HMOs, so between three and six individuals. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that explanation. Councillor Hughes, please. I think Councillor Griffith is before me, I think. No, I said Simon Hughes, yeah, uh, Councillor, uh, sorry, yeah, Councillor Hughes. Ah, uh, sorry, Councilor Griffith, Griffith, sorry, <laughs> my fault, yes, getting mixed up with the names. Sorry, Simon? Um, I just want to go back to the maths question here because I think it is important. I mean, we, we, are, we are always reminded of the importance of the LDP and sticking to those regulations as they as they given as, as an organisation and they are a, a statutory guide. Um, the fact that this this calculation of of two over twenty nine is, is below ten percent and three over twenty nine is is clearly over over ten percent. You you can't just round up one of the numbers. Um, because what you do, what what was what what do you do if it's two over twenty five? Do you run twenty? Do you run twenty five up or do you run twenty five down? There's there's no guidance in in the LDP about the rounding, and so you just take it at face value, which is you work at the percentage, and the percentage in this case is over our LDP number. So I, I'm I'm sorry for being a pedant around the, the numbers, but if we're going to put numbers in our LDP, and this this is not just guidance, it's a it's a, it's a statutory LDP. And, and to me, this is outside our guidance. Um, so I, I just want, this is my view, and this is the way I'm reading this, which is this is outside our guidance. That doesn't mean that we have to disallow it. It means that we can still allow it. But technically speaking, I, I believe that we are working outside the guidance within the LDP if we uh, um, if we give permission for something that takes us to um, a, a number which is actually above 10%. So it, it, is, it is my view, but I'm pedant for the actual numbers and the maths in this. Thank you for that, Simon. Jonathan will answer that question now. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I can't argue with the maths. The maths is what they are. I can't change the laws of mathematics. Um, but this is what I mentioned earlier, Councillor Griffiths, was the balance and the evidence. That's important as well. These quantitative, qualitative factors um, need to be balanced out. And in this case, the recommendation is, is for approval because we've taken all those into account. The, the the policy situation, yeah, it's, it's a very very marginal increase on what the policy allows, very marginal. But is it enough to reject the planning application on that alone? I would say professionally, I would advise the committee. It's it's very unlikely that that policy, if we imply that strictly and on that alone, then it it it, it is unlikely to uh, succeed or or. or um, it would likely be challenged at, at, at appeal. But yeah, I can't argue with the maths. Um, but as I said, a lot of things we're planning. Uh, it's, um, it, it's, it's, it's it's every other factor that needs to be taken into account. The evidence needs to be taken into account. So regardless of the, the policy position, which is the starting point, all material considerations, this is a legal requirement under the Town and Country Planning Act, um, it's that all material considerations have to be taken into account. One of the primary ones is the development plan, but there are other material considerations as well that need to be taken into account. OK, thank you for that. Sorry, Della, down to you. No problem. <laughs> Can I just ask, um, Councillor Bledsoe said there's another application coming in or always come in. How would you work then, for example, this is a 50 metre radius, and then you might have an application that comes in that's just outside that 50 metre radius. So in essence, in a, in a space of time, you could still have an awful lot of HMOs in, for example, Park Street area. So when does the point come where you w wouldn't just look at the 50 metres and, and could you then look at the whole area and you'd think, well, actually, this is, it might meet the, 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 the numbers, but it, it would be too much then. How, how would you decide that? Jonathan, we'll come back to you yeah, that. It's, again, we'll go back to evidence and facts and material circumstances. So it, there could be technical compliance with the policy, but there may be other material factors that, that, would, um, that would come into play there. So it's a fact and degree. I can't give you a straight answer to that. It depends on what comes forward. We'll take it all, everything into account on its own individual merits. But it's a good point to bring up. Thank you for that, Councillor Hughes. Councillor Pratt, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, sorry. Um, the um, just we obviously we're not moving it from a residential property to a HMO. This used to be office space, 
uh, or it still currently is in, 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 until the um, in, unless this is approved. Um, how long has the property not been occupied as an office? You know, has it been sitting derelict for a long time? Has, has it just come on the market? That sort of that, those sort of questions. And what is the impact of loss on office space in Bridgend if you are replacing it with a HMO? Thank you, Chair. Do you know, we can bring the applicants on. We wouldn't know necessarily how long it's been there. Yeah. We can ask the applicant if he's been there. Uh, Jamie, are you still online? Yes, I'm still here. Right, thank you. Can you just answer that one question? How long has the property been empty for? Uh, I believe, I, I don't know the exact time scale, but I believe it's somewhere between about 12 and 18 months. OK, thank you for that. And Jonathan's going to come back on the second part to you, Jonathan. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, Councillor Pratt. Um, th th this site's not within the bounds, the defined bounds of the Regen Town Centre. Uh, it's not primary, it's, it's not the primary shopping area. Um, and I think a building of this size, uh, it wouldn't it wouldn't be a, a significant impact if the art office space was lost. Um, if you were changing office space on an industrial estate from B1 use to another use, then that will be a different matter. That will be counted as part of the um, uh, of the B1 supply within the county borough. But something of this nature is not is not a significant would be a significant impact in this particular case. Uh, but it's a valid point to bring up, uh, and it was useful to have the clarification that the, <clears throat> the property has been um, uh, unoccupied for 18 months, and it's clear that there's, there is there is there was no interest to to bring it back into an office use. Uh, and these will be factors as well, even if this was in a town centre or location or in a, um, when I say town centre, in a defined town centre or within industries, it, just to say, these are the factors we'd have to take into account as well, is, is whether the, the property has been effectively marketed over that period of time. But in this particular case, this, this, this not, um, is not, um, hasn't been material in, in, in the plan and balance for this particular application. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that. Councillor Clark, please. Well, thank you, Chair. I'd just like to ask for a vote on this application, please. Certainly. Is that seconded? Thank you. Do you want to take your hand down, Laura? Right, so is a, it's been moved and seconded that we take a, a vote on, on this. So it's just for and against again. And the legal officer will call out your names for or against. Thank you. Okay. Right, starting with Councillor Barrow, please. For. Councillor Nora Clark. Against. Councillor Richard Collins. Absent. Aye, absent. Okay. Councillor Chris Davies. Absent. Councillor Easterbrook. Absent. Councillor Richard Granville. For. Councillor Heather Griffiths. For. Councillor Simon Griffiths. For. Councillor David Harrison. Against. Councillor Martin Hughes. Against. Councillor Della Hughes. Against. Councillor Mark John. Against. Councillor Mike Cairn. Councillor Cairn. Against. Councillor William Kendall. For. Councillor Joanna Thwellin Hopkins. For. Councillor Jonathan Pratt. Against. Councillor Alan Waffen. Against. Councillor Richard Williams. Um, I'm, I'm unable to vote in this as I declare this uh, prejudicial interest. Thank you. Okay. Right, Councillor Williams. Thank you. Okay. So we have two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight against one, two, three, four, five, six, four. So it's, it's lost. So it's, so it's against. So can we have something from one of you? 
the reasons why you're objecting to this if it goes to appeal. So which is going to be the spokesman for the people that voted against? Well, you know, you, you voted against, so you've got to have a reason in your head. Planning reasons. Planning reasons. There's got to be legitimate planning reasons now. No and one. you're asking for those now? Yeah. Yes. Please. Well, I would I would go for the perception of fear and safety. Okay. I would also go for the uh, the mathematical whatever, whatever it was, that is over the 10%. Ten yeah. ten and anything else? Yeah, that it's 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 against policy. Any any other any other offer from members? We'll go for those three for the time being until we can think of other things. Uh, can I just say to be look to be fair, you right? That perhaps I put you on the spot, Nora. But if you all want to get together after this meeting, put something together and then put it in to one of the officers, right? Of what you are objecting to, then uh, you know yeah. that would be a bit fair for you, I think. Yeah, that's that's okay. I I, I do hope that we'll have off, some officers help with it. Yeah, yeah. Well, do you want to say that? Oh yes, sorry, my microphone's on. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm Gillian Dawson, the solicitor here. Uh, it's important when you formulate your reasons for refusal that they are sound planning reasons, um, because you have to bear in mind that on appeal, it, they would need to stand up in respect of a cost application against the council. Councillor Pratt. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Can I ask for a point of clarity? Last time you refused. Uh, a, a planning application which was then subsequently approved. Um, I was left on my Todd as approved by this committee to to uh, to, to go forward, which was fine and I had a lot of help from um, from, from Jonathan. Um, is, is that the strategy we're supposed to use? Or it, it, I, I think it's only fair if this committee says, Jonathan, go away and deal with it, which I did, um, to, to the best of my ability with a lot of help from Jonathan. Um, I think it's fair that we stick to the same procedure. Thank you, Chair. Jonathan. Yes, th thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, yeah, the, the, the procedures, um, the protocols for where a member of the mind to go against officer recommendation is that we, we can't make that decision today. That decision can't be made today. It has to come back to a subsequent development control committee meeting um, where the reasons are then presented to that committee and then there's another vote as to whether they accept those reasons. The, the example where what Councillor Pratt was referring to, in that particular case, members were minded to approve that particular application. However, um, I would point out, as, as, as Gillian has, has indicated, that um, we have to anticipate that this will go to an appeal. So this will be the Council's case on an appeal. Now, as officers, we can assist as much as we can, but uh, we're all hostile to this situation now. The case officer in particular, he can't assist you because the case officer has put a, a report together asking for approval or, or recommending approval. Uh, I'm in a difficult position because I too, as my name is on that report, I'm recommending approval. But we can give you technical assistance as much as possible. But I would, I would strongly urge members that you have to get these uh, reasons for refusal on sound planning grounds mm. and at the moment what I've got is perception of fear and policy. Now you have to be very comfortable that those reasons are sufficient and you have to demonstrate the harm that will be caused by this development in planning, land use planning terms. Now if they are the, the reasons that you wish to bring forward now um, then that's fine but you have to the, those, those reasons on, on, on themselves can, are not sufficient. You're going to have to um, put a bit more body to those reasons and demonstrate the harm that will be caused. Uh, I'm not. I'm not threatening, and this is the reality of it. You have to pull out of those particular reasons what you consider to be the main land use planning consideration. And I've mentioned about the policy before. It's very, very marginal. You have to be very comfortable that that policy 
that marginal increase on the on the on the policy would be sufficient to stand up to scrutiny at a at an appeal hearing, possibly. I, I agree with yeah. all you're saying, but if you went a little bit over on everyone in every fifty meters, you've you've you have got yeah. a lot more. But so it's this, you've got it's, a... thank you. Yeah, it's a very valid point. But this this application you are considering now. Yeah. yeah. But it's if you if if that's if those are the reasons you wish to go forward, that's fine. Uh, but now is the opportunity if you to introduce anything else at this point, uh, and then we'd, we'd have to bring a report back to the next uh, development control committee, which would be May the fifteenth. Fifteenth, yeah. And members will have an opportunity to agree with those reasons, but if we could all go back to the original recommendation. But we haven't got to do that right now. We can look at that. How long have we got to give the you know to give a more meat on the bone to the reasons for refusal then? Uh, you've got until the report is sent out for for May, uh, okay. which will be the week before. Three weeks, Stella. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Um, but as I said, we can officers will provide technical assistance, but leading the leading any appeal will be down to um, the lead member, which is it. <laughs> no, <laughs> is it a joint? <laughs> is it is it <laughs> Councillor Hughes and Councillor Clark or, or yeah, yeah, the the famous duo. Yeah. Um, but we we can give you technical advice and I, I'm, I'm quite happy to do that separately to this meeting if you wish. OK, thank you. Simon? Uh, may I suggest a, a short break, Chair? It's coming up to an hour and a half. Is that possible? Yeah, we'll have a quick break for 10 minutes and 25 to. OK, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank you, Chair.